Okay, for the next hour, I'm going about to do something that I almost never do, which is talk about mathematics for more than about 30 seconds at a time. Um, and uh, I, I, I hope you find it en enjoyable. I think that I found useful enough that I ended up actually enjoying it. Now, people who actually know math will, will laugh at the end of, of seeing this, uh, that I'm calling it mathematics, but it's very applicable uh, ways of, of calculating interesting things that, that give you insight and are useful. So um, here's, here's what I would like an album of interesting operations to do on time series. And there's, I surprised myself when I pulled together the of course, but still different interesting operations that are to do on time series. It's really nice to collect them all in one place because they were invented for reasons, and they end up being, being really, really useful. For our purposes, I'll, I'll emphasize one particular goal of, of this part of the talk, and that is to put out in some official way, it won't be formal, but some official way, a statement of what a power spectrum is and how to interpret it. We've been looking at the school, and probably most of you have encountered them, but nevertheless, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting enough thing that I, I think it's nice to say, okay, this is this object that we've been graphing. Um, th th talk about some, some ways that I never encountered in my formal physics training, but that, um, um, that I soon learned were important ways of characterizing some system. A linear system, okay, we have nonlinearities too, but linear systems are the sort of things that you encounter in undergraduate physics, and we're taught ways of thinking about how to find the answers to problems. And when I got into this business that now I use all the time, and again, you'll notice as soon as, as, soon as I get to this material, assuming, um, and I think it's probably worth walking through. An example of the use of all these things, I'll talk from the point of view of this linear system theory and using uh, the oscillator in a way that's useful and, in fact, that I'll turn to and make use of more uh, in tomorrow's, tomorrow's lectures. So that's where we're going. Okay, into using um, the concept of a time series, a single valued function of t. And object we would think of all the time, but what's special about a time series, well, by the time we are using the concept of a, a single valued function of a single variable that we call t, um, it's really useful in our business series, such as uh, you can sort them into the categories of deterministic or random, or a sum of deterministic and random. Okay, so where would I encounter a deterministic time series in the search? What sort of function of time might the concept of randomness be 100% foreign? I'm thinking of somebody understands the physics of a source of gravitational waves and work it out, okay? And it's a very valuable thing to have worked out, and every little detail in the wiggles of H and T or H of. All right, that was too tricky. How about this one? Where might I encounter a a random time series? Noise. Yeah. Good. Okay. And random process. Say it, say it, Manasha. Interaction with wave with matter. Oh, that's a subtle one. I want, I want a more obvious one. Okay, that might be random. Okay, it might be noise unless that apparently random time series is a copy of this deterministic function of time that I would like to find. Okay, so I'm suggesting um, where where these and now time series. Uh, so for us to, to, to have a toolkit all spread out on a counter in front of us. So perhaps the most important one, surely one of the most important operations on a time series, uh, is the Fourier transform. And the room has encountered the Fourier transform. We've surely been implicitly using them so far in this school. Um, I've written down with uh, the definition of the Fourier transform of the 
time series by e to the minus i omega t integrate over dt. And, and here's where I'm going to betray my, my, my experimentalist leanings. Um, I care much more about interpretation of this of interpretation is it's a measure of the amount of a sine and a cosine of each frequency function x of t in a in a in a in a sum and let me just assert that i think this is true that to just do the fourier transform and stop is when x of t is a deterministic function but we'll see uh that end up being useful when, when we've got uh, random time series. Here, because this is a, a, as, as good a way as any to introduce um, a, a pair of, of exploded my brain when I first learned it. That's this notion that we live in the time domain, but doing this operation and then thinking about some, some x of t, some h of t, looking at it, in the frequency domain, that is, look at the function that you get when you take the Fourier transform of this. This frequency domain is often a place where you can get very important and interesting insights. And it's also often the case, uh, the situation where operations that are very hard to do in the time domain suddenly magically become simple. So thinking that we can uh, describe the same phenomenon that describe it in the frequency domain is a really important tool. Okay, so let's put the Fourier transform aside for the moment. Operation where we need two time series to start with as inputs uh, to this operation, and that's the cross correlation of cross between x1 and x2 of a time variable tau is defined by the integral from minus infinity to infinity, integral over all time, of the product of the one time series with the second one having the time shift tau in its argument. So this is a x1 of t looks like it has the same shape as x2 of t, and uh, if the two are functions are shifted with respect to each other, not just uh, asking are they the same function. Okay, and now here's a hint of, uh, of where this operation shows up. Maybe we want, want to consider one of these to be a, uh, a noisy time series and the other a deterministic one. And we want to ask, is there something that looks like that deterministic series? A problem that's dear to my heart. Asking the question, by what method is it a good, is, by one method, ought one this? And the answer is, if you actually know the shape of the signal that you expect or hope is buried in the noise, the cross-correlation between a function that is the, the shape of the relation between that time series and the time series that might be just random noise or and, and this deterministic function. So here's something, oh, I don't know, does this have a signal or not? Hmm, signal that I suspect might be buried in there. So calculating the cross correlation between this time series, and we've taken this function over at different locations along the timeline. Do the pointwise multiplication for each particular shift tau of the deterministic function. And then here's the output. Still got some noise. It didn't make the noise go away. Whether this looks more interesting, perhaps, than this. Does it? Let me take a vote. Does this look more interesting than the first line? Hunting for gravity waves. All right. So that operation, that there's something that looks suspiciously like this function buried in the original time um, What? Uh, let me not phrase it in the form of a question. Let me assert that the contrast, the wiggles in this time series is has been improved. This is a way of extracting weak signals from strong noise. Okay. And 
what the shape is of the signal that you're looking for, this operation or something closely related to it is the optimal way to extract, uh, to make. Okay, let me leave it like that. Okay, so we've already got uh, a great outcome of this algorithm. We found out how to extract weak signals from noise. Okay, so here's another uh, cousin of the cross correlation. This is the autocorrelation. It's the cross correlation between a function and itself. Um, it's not quite as obvious. This it's not quite as obvious why this might be useful. So the function kind of looks like itself once it's been shifted. Or at least that it's shifted only a tiny bit and then gradually not the outcomes of this. That this is a really, really important operation to have in our, in our toolkit. Again, it's, it looks kind of like the cross correlation, but with a with a, a, a subtle difference. Again, we need two time series, x1 of t and x2 of t. And again, we're going to do multiplication and shift. But look at the argument. Instead of t plus tau, we've got tau minus t. And in a, later in this hour, I'm going to uh, preview that it's this operation that describes the action of some linear system that we might call a filter on an input. It relates, it gives the output um, of uh, what to talk about is something that I found that, that, that everyone in this room has encountered the Fourier transform. We've surely been implicitly using them so far in this school, uh, both, both characters. Okay, now we're finally going to, 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 to get to a spot that I, that I said we were aiming at, and that's to define the power spectrum. So if I have a function, x of t, and I want to know its power spectrum, form the autocorrelation of that function, and then take the correlation. And with this choice of normalization, that's what we call what? in the world could this mean heuristically? Because of the Fourier transform operation, flipping us from the time domain into the frequency domain, it's clearly got to be telling us something about the amount of wiggling that's happening at one frequency versus we've got in effect this square of, of the action of the, of the autocorrelation. And that's thrown away the phase information. There's nothing that survives here that sine of 30 hertz, not a cosine of 30 hertz. That's gone away. Um, but there's a lot of wiggling going on at 30 hertz and its vicinity, but by the time we get to 40 hertz, there's much less. This is m most often used, it's, re it's really designed to be used on, on random time series, such as the noise spectra that we've been talking about. Um, in our instruments. Something I should have pointed out, um, that this object, just like, just as the Fourier transform, this object as well, as I've defined it, is, has um, values of my graph paper um, showing, showing what goes on at, ne at, at negative object of the Fourier transform itself, but of the power spectrum, it is. So I've joined the camp of people who like a slightly different object, the single-sided power spectrum, which takes the power spectrum and only writes so that the integral over all frequencies um, is the same as it was for the official power spectrum frequencies where I'm going to keep it and then wipe it out. Um, at negative frequencies and, and pay no attention to it. And normally you can tell whether, well, if you see a graph, you can almost always tell that someone is plotting a single-sided power spectrum because um, they're, they're not. In notation, usually s sub whatever variable, it's a power spectrum of. 
And at least in the communities that I'm a part of, you often write something like x squared of f if you mean the universal. Pay a little bit of attention, but almost always, almost always you'll, you'll know. And sometimes people are even polite enough to say, this is a, no, this is a single-sided power spectrum. All right, now, and it's this theorem that uh, we need to understand the interpretation of the power spectrum. So first, I want to talk about um, one more kind of object called the periodogram. So the periodogram of a function of time x of t is um, of a potentially infinite x of t of duration um, the uh, Fourier transform with an integral just over that duration t, square it, and divide by t. And here is the interesting theorem that if you do that operation and then you take the limit as goes to infinity, the expectation value of that periodogram is precisely the power spectrum. Definition, first you do the autocorrelation and then a Fourier transform. Here you do a Fourier transform first, then take norm squared, normalize it with the T. So at least to me it's non-obvious. It is true, and in fact, um, I, th this is the algorithm that is almost always used to calculate the um, um, the power the power spectrum because for any kind of, of object that I'm going to look at it doesn't it doesn't add any information to me that's not true of the Fourier transform itself but of the power spectrum it is so I've joined the camp of people who like a slightly different object the single-sided power spectrum, which takes the power spectrum and only writes it down for positive frequencies, but of how much oscillation there is in that time series at one frequency or another without the nicety of saying, and here, just throwing that out by the, by the norm square. Um, Now, I believe, in fact, I remember Rana making exactly this statement, but I want to repeat it because um, it's, it's, it's an important aspect of building up intuition for these, for these things. So you could um, imagine yet another way to calculate the power spectrum. And the power spectrum, let's, let's say you have a fixed resolution of one of one hertz wide bins over all frequency you're going to care about. What you could do is make yourself a bank of bandpass filters of one half a hertz, one and a half hertz, two and a half hertz, three and a half hertz, and so on, up to as high, um, high a frequency as you want. So apply the same signal, fan it out to the inputs of all those one hertz wide bandpass filters. So the output, right? But now, at the output of each of those filters, measure the mean square value um, of, or the, yeah, the mean square sat down. So the set of mean squares of the, so on, is in fact the power spectrum. It's the amount of power, amount of mean, uh, mean square wiggling uh, that goes through a one hertz band uh, bandwidth at at each frequencies. And now, here is um, theorem. If you sum up over all those bins um, what the mean squares are, that is to say, sum up the power spectrum over all frequencies. That is the mean square value of x of t. So the integral of the power spectrum over all frequencies is the mean square of, of the time series. I guess, guess that should be called a theorem that I'm not going to prove. And 
I'm, I'm bothering to make that statement because I want us to be thinking of a fact that, that Rana mentioned when he brought this up yesterday, that something we could see from the definition of the power spectrum, the units of it are units of the variable of the Times a, a stumbling block, but it's precisely interpretable in terms of okay, it's been passed at this frequency, that frequency, the third, and so on. Now, here is where it starts looking confusing, but I hope having gone through this path, it before. That's my hope, anyway. Experimenters are bad enough, they want to do single-sided power spectra that's considered, that's really tasteless, but we do it all the time anyway. And that is to say, ah, squared, I've got a voltmeter, the scale on my oscilloscope is registered. So what do we do? We take the square root of the power spectrum and say, that's the thing I want to make a graph of. And we give it a name, the amplitude spectral density, because it's amplitude and not power. But you take the square root of that thing that already has slightly stand right, when they first encounter it. The units of this are, oh, volts, that's good, but volts per root hertz. It's the residue of graphing something on a frequency axis where you dare not integrate over that frequency axis before you care about how much is going on between one frequency and density. Square it first on a log scale. And then you've got an object of which an inner hertz to 20 hertz is a meaningful thing. Okay. So we paid a price by killing that per hertz that made sense and making it per root hertz. A bit of um, each frequency bin in the spectrum and how do you combine independent random variables, you know, the squares of things, and then uh, power spectrum being meaningful, but the implication that square root first. Um, if you find that helpful, great. If not, but an amplitude spectral density. Right, right. So the amplitudes, I better remember them up and then take the square root. So, so fussy about voltage, an independent random variable, and how do you combine? Right. I could have, but I don't know anyone who does. Do you, Ron? No, we always always take the square root. Yeah, okay. Ron and I are come from the same community. Um. <laughs> share, share, share your laboratory wisdom with people, but... <laughs> yeah, he displayed many amplitude spectral density graphs, right? H of F, X of F, Ollie, I don't remember. Uh-huh, okay, so by the time it showed up on your slide, it was an amplitude spectral density? Yeah, okay. All right. Ollie was so desperate to use amplitude spectral densities that he did the square root by hand. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So that's, that's, my, that's my album of applicable mathematical operations on, on time series. And, and I've seen them uh, in, these, uh, in these. So something that I very grandly called the theory of linear systems. And uh, we'll, we'll see how much, how much people think I've, I've covered the topic. But I think I have some interesting things to say, things I was happy to learn uh, when, when, I, when I encountered this for the first time. So um, what, I what do I mean when I say linear system for, for the next half? This is a 
single output from a single input for which there is a linear relationship between the input and the output, which is a lot of words. Here's, a, here's an example. So let's say I have a system that system, I get an output V1 of T. When I apply H2 of T, if it's a linear system, then by this H2 of T as an input, my output is simply the sum of what the outputs would have been in the individual case. This much isn't very interesting, but it's, it's, it's what we need to, to define what we're talking about. All right. Now, we couldn't avoid talking about harmonic oscillators over and over already this week. Here is an, uh, another harmonic oscillator. It's going to come back when I talk about seismic noise, a mass on a spring interpreted as a linear system. And how, how am I going to do that? I'm going to talk about an input and an output. This is a mass suspended by a spring from something that I can either move with my own volition or that moves in a way that I can. This plate or this hand, its vertical position as a function of time is the function that I want to consider the input. And the motion of the mass itself in the vertical direction as a function of time. OK. It's either interesting or not. I think it is interesting, and I will try to convince you of that. All right. A little bit more of, of terminology. When I have a linear input and output have the same units, I call it a filter. When I have a linear system whose input and output have different units, I call it a transducer. Useful. Okay, so applying is this filter or transducer, gravity wave detector, transducer. Input is H of T out output. Okay, it's either interesting or not. I think it is interesting, and I will try to convince you what I knew how to do for that system write down a differential equation that was an inertial term, a spring term, and it's here in the, in the spring where attached to the top end of the spring, the, the force, the Hooke's law force I get out of the, the spring has to do with the uh, distance between input and output. And just to make it so that things don't blow up, so that graphs don't look terrible, I'm going to put something in the equation of motion that I didn't put in the diagram, namely a little bit of damping. Okay, um, so what am I to imagine? I grab that uh, plate and I'm interested in finding what is the motion of the mass, the thing I'm calling x out. Slightly uh, um, through a way to do this in the time domain that has some utility, but I have, I will confess, I don't think I've ever willingly solved a linear system problem with exactly the mathematics I'm going to do. It's, um, and let's do it some other way instead. So, one well defined thing to do to, um, uh, is to learn to, that is to say, make and for this particular system, at least at the graphical level, you know what a sinusoid that because I've put some damping in, you can maybe just barely time scale, you can clearly see the exponential damping. So this is what happens if you just kick kick that top with a this is what you get. Actually writing it down exactly right get okay. but um, but there's, there's a certain amount of insight in, in staring at this. I mean, this is the Now, is there any other insight we can get out of it? Um, of, of, do, of illustrating this math, we've done this be applying some, um, some random noise to, uh, to that input. But here is an interesting input, xi of tau, and you want to know the output 
x out of t, and the input time series and the output time series is a convolution integral. This is that convolution up uh, integrated from all negative times up to the present. Now, here's a, a way of let's get some let's get some intuition. Um, plus is that what's happened? What has happened to the system at this instant right now is based on everything that happened to it in the past. If the whole past history of inputs was a, a long string of delta functions mapping out what that input time series was, the inputs that happened a long time ago have had a chance to decay away. The, um, and it's this particular actual answer. So here's a way of writing it out. The present value of the output Input times uh, the tau equals zero um, uh, value of the of the impulse response, um, and you add to that uh, what the input was a second ago uh, times the impulse response appropriate to one second after the impulse arrives, and so on, and everything in between because I couldn't type um, every possible pass. Now, is this an option? some arbitrary function uh, uh, in that convolution way, do this summation? I wouldn't. It's really nice to do it, but it's hard to do. So let's take it for insight and hope that's more easily calculatable. There is. Um, is maybe as, as big a payoff as I want to talk about the frequency response. If I've got a generic frequency response and it's coming from something with an impulse response I called of F, what is it? It is the Fourier transform of the Now, with or not, you might be surprised if you were confident that taking the Fourier transform of the impulse response was an Everyone should do it, except you don't have to do it with this op pain, and then you got to do a Fourier transform. I want to show you how you can do this without any of these hard calculations. And then how, up and back, this is what you get. Actually writing it down exactly right, getting the normalization exactly right. Okay. Let me quote a theorem. This theorem has a grand name, the convolution theorem. And it says that the Fourier transform could be written in the form of the rest of this expression, which is the output calculated in the time domain of a linear system. But now here's the statement of the theorem. The Fourier transform of the output is equal to the frequency response. Isn't that amazing? That's amazing. This convolution integral is a pain. And then, all right, we have machines that will do Fourier transforms. But this is a lot of math. This is really simple. Even I can multiply two frequency domains. Okay? Input are related by a simple multiplicative operation when we are living in the frequency domain. Often. Um, first, let's talk a bit more about it. So, I can just, by simple rearrangement, simple algebra, illustrate. Then I can interpret G of F as the complex ratio as a function of frequency between the frequency domain uh, transform of the output divided by the Fourier transform of the input. So this already says the frequency, do uh, frequency response is big at frequencies at which the system does a lot of oscillating when there's a little bit of input at that fre frequencies for which there's not that much response to an input at that frequency. We haven't thrown away any phase information here. We've got the real genuine Fourier transform, not its square. 
thinking about it this way also invites you to invent a way to measure the frequency system, put it on your bench, get yourself a sine wave generator and a two-channel oscilloscope and start down at some low frequency, the output of that uh, sine wave generator to the input of your system, put that on one channel of your scope, hook the output of the system to the other channel at the same frequency, measure their amplitude ratio, that's the magnitude of this object, measure the phase shift, and now turn the frequency up, do it again, do it again make a graph. I'm old enough to remember doing that as a way of measuring these things. No one should ever do it more than once to learn what it is. Then there's better ways. The boxes that Rana and Ali were talking about do it for us much better, but everyone should do it once. It reminds you of what the frequency response means. Now, I'm going to claim that if I can write down the differential equation that is the equation of derive the frequency response, a very uh, good degree of truth or truthiness, I can solve arbitrary linear differential equations with algebra alone. As long as I'm willing to declare the response of the system is, is a solution. Here is math that lets me see how to do that. Um, so I want to say that is the uh, value of the Fourier. If I'm applying a sinusoid of frequency f as an input, the a sinusoid of that amplitude, and I don't know the phase relationship between the sinusoid I see on this channel of my two-channel scope and the sinusoid that I see up here. But, and then I'm going to recall that the time derivative of e to the i 2 pi ft is i derivative of e to the i omega t. And since I'm assuming that my input has this characteristic and uh, characteristic form. I'm just going to plug in these relationships, which are the only, which capture the only interesting derivatives for the x dot and the x double dot. I 2 pi ft, which shows up in every term, just cancel it out. And now I've got an algebraic equation representing what used to be a differential equation. And by I can find, I can uh, rearrange this and find the ratio of the Fourier transform of the output to the Fourier transform of the input, and that is G of f. It's the frequency response. And here it is displayed. This is the frequency response of a harmonic oscillator. I didn't have to know anything other than turning this crank. And I've got a function of frequency that I now want to show carries a tremendous amount of, of insight. So here is algebra to solve an equation, and now I want to uh, deliver on my claim that this is a good way. To, to do that, I want to introduce one very standard response. Everyone learns to do this. Um, there could be others, many other ways to graph a complex function of frequency. Bode plot has two subplots in it, displayed one above another. They always have an official way. And in the top sub magnitude of G of F on a log scale. It's to use the traditional units of dB, decibels, that's not always required, but it's considered take log base 10 of the magnitude of G of F. But if you, if you skip that part, no one will be too offended. The bottom subplot is a plot on a linear scale of the phase of G of F, plotted between minus 180 and plus 180. Now I want oops. the Bode plot of the frequency response of our system. Isn't that beautiful? Doesn't that just carry a real message to it? Okay, so here's the magnitude part, here's the frequency part. We can read off the resonant frequency. There's that resonance, 
right there. Okay, for the numbers I put in, it's oh, about 0.13 hertz. And something shows up in the frequency. There's a 180 degree phase shift in the negative direction. What else can we learn? That at frequencies that are low compared with the resonant <laughs> frequency, the amplitude as it is low. At frequencies that are high compared with the resonance, there's a And if we do a little bit more care, we've been talking about that, MA in Newton's law. What else can we see? If you apply an input at frequencies low compared with the output, the output tracks the input. If you shake at frequencies high, an antiphase. This is a lot of insight into what that system graph. Almost none of it. So we understand a phenomenon just by spending a minute or two looking at, at this graph. Um, here I've written it down. Okay. So tracking the input at low frequencies as we, so you're saying it's a stiffness controlled um, for the 1 over frequency squared response at high frequencies, that's uh, inertial control. That off is, is uh, just from that graph is really remarkable. So why is this graph? That's, thing, that's uh, idea number one. Here's something that will show up more um, uh, when we talk about control systems. If I've got a set of linear systems where the out another, then the frequency response of those two together is just the product of the frequency, the convolution, again, okay, is tremendously helpful. You can measure it in a straightforward way. If you don't know the equation of motion, but you've got a system on your bench, measure it. You'll recognize things, okay, and it will suggest to you um, what the equation of motion might be. Now, um, because it's something great, different kinds of behavior that show up in uh, stiffness control example, uh, harmonic a single harmonic oscillator example. And because of that, with just a little bit of practice, you gain a lot of intuition. So in this business and not here, oh, in this frequency range, the system is behaving like this. We always uh, for these reasons. So I hope I've persuaded you that Attending to some of this uh, mathematics is, is worth And let me a couple minutes early turn it over to Rana. And okay. All right, I see a hand. Yes. Yes, it's buried in there somewhere. Yes, it must. Do you, do you think you could read a, an impulse around it? system that Peter is showing, which is a high Q harmonic oscillator, present the impulse response accurately, you actually need to plot lots and lots of points. And the, the, the digital signal processing way to say this is that the uh, finite impulse response filter, which you need to represent this filter, is very long, has a lot of coefficients. The second order system can be represented by just a few coefficients using the infinite impulse response filter representation. And there's a symmetry there where whenever the case is so that that kind of digital processing is better, we would always be better by the system can be well represented by a very short impulse response. Frequency response looks like some complicated, crazy thing, and you don't want to, you don't want to have it. But uh, yeah, it, it, it becomes very clear when you try to do digital signal processing because you find that there are just recursive algorithm for which are sort of high Q things.
input should be periodic We can have an input of any character, and taking the Fourier transform of that gives us the Fourier transform of the output. So this is applicable in, in any actual case. Uh, we just use the, the sinusoidal inputs to derive, to derive what it is for our interpretation. Does that answer your question, or were you asking something different? Actually, do a Fourier transform. You you can imagine your subtle inputs that work very straight. Then when then this when you're done, already I already never have to, to to restrict my application <laughs> to the sinusoidal problem. Sinusoidal by any periodic. Term. Oh, any periodic. Term. It doesn't have to be peri no. It doesn't have to be periodically. No, it could be a. Maybe I'm not understanding the, the, the gist of your question. Maybe I'll talk about it later. 